Okay, I, my name's Lee Wallace. I'm the director of Shark. I'd like to um, acknowledge that you've all come here tonight and that we're now on uh, Gadigal country. Uh, and uh, we'd like to pay our respects to the traditional owners and of this land and acknowledge the power and knowledge that's forever vested in country. So I'd like to hand over um, pretty quickly now to Lisa Adkins, the uh, Dean of uh, FAS of uh, Arts and Social Sciences, and she's going to welcome you here tonight. Thank you so much, Lee. I hope you can all hear me okay. Um, welcome everyone to the Sydney Social Sciences and, hum and Humanities Advanced Research Center, or as we like to term it, SHARK event, a very special one. Um, with our Hunt Symes Visiting Chair in Sexuality Studies, Professor Susanna Pargonen. So welcome um, from both Shark and from our faculty. The Hunt Symes Visiting Chair in Sexuality Studies is genu generous, generously funded by a bequest from the late Gary Symes, who was a linguistic historian, a biographer, and a University of Sydney alumni and named for him and his partner. This is the inaugural year of the Hunt Signs. Um, and while um, Susanna is the very first of our chairs, we also would like to extend a welcome to Jen Gilbert from York University, Canada, who's also a Hunt Signs um, chair and has arrived just today. So welcome. And later in the year, we'll be welcoming Associate Professor Srila Roy from Wits University, South Africa. So in the area of trusts and bequests, it actually takes quite a lot of work to get a really good outcome such as this. And I want to thank, although she's not here, Tiffany Britton, who's our faculty's gifts and scholarships manager, as well as, well as Lee Wallace, who's the director of SHARP, for helping to imagine how this bequest could operate in our faculty. We are particularly pleased to have a bequest in this area. The need for informed research and discussion around gender and sexuality has really never been more pressing. So over to Susanna. Susanna is, as you'll all know, Professor of Media Studies at the University of Turku in Finland. Her, her work has influence really in three key, key areas, media theory, sexuality studies, and affect theory. To my mind, what distinguishes her thinking is how she has brought together the study of digital media with affect, often to open in really compelling ways, debates that we thought had been finalized as if there was nothing more to say. I believe her work is provocative in the very best sense of, that, of the word. Now she's written so many books, it's difficult to name them all, but I'll just name some of them. They include Dependent, Distracted, Bored, Who's Laughing Now, Objectification, and Carnal Resonance. On a more personal note, I've spent quite a bit of time in Finland over the course of my career. And I think it's fair to say that in that context, as in other national domains, it's pretty tough for ECRs and MCRs to establish themselves. While Susanna is an international star, I know firsthand from being in Finland, just how much time she ded dedicates to career development and the mentoring of others. She is an all round good citizen, and we very much like those here. And we are delighted to have her here this evening. And with that, I'll hand over to Kane. Thanks very much, Lisa. So hello, everyone. My name is Kane Rice. I'm a professor of gender and cultural studies here at the University of Sydney. And um, it's my pleasure to be chairing tonight's event on why is sex objectionable? Um, as Lisa mentioned, the occasion for tonight's conversation is uh, Professor Susanna Parsonen's visit here to the University of Sydney as a Hunt Science Chair of Sexuality Studies. Um, Susanna has been here for the last several weeks, um, running workshops, giving talks, and just generally sharing her um, wonderful knowledge and insights 
uh, into the domains of uh, media, affect, sexuality studies, and um, media theory and affect theory generally. And we're very lucky tonight to be joined by two uh, wonderful uh, experts in sexuality and uh, cultural studies and uh, digital studies. Um, they are Professor uh, Alan McKee, who is a professor of digital and social media at UTS. Um, he's published widely on entertainment and healthy sexual development. He's the author of a large number of books across the domain of uh, media, entertainment and cultural studies. Uh, perhaps most relevant to tonight's discussion, um, there's the Porn Report, which uh, Alan co-authored with um, our other wonderful panelists, Kath Aubrey and with Catherine Lumby, who's with us tonight. Um, also, Alan is the author of Pornography, Structures, Agency and Performance with uh, Rebecca Sullivan. Uh, he's the author of Fun, What Entertainment Tells Us About Living a Good Life. And also one of the authors of uh, a recent publication uh, with Susanna actually, um, Objectification on the Difference Between Sex and Sexism. And that was uh, written by Fiona Atwood, John Mercer, uh, Alan, Susanna, um, and Clarissa Smith. Um, so welcome, Alan, and thanks for joining us. And uh, our other wonderful panelist is uh, Professor Kath Albury, who is a professor of media at Swinburne University of Technology. Um, Kath has published really widely on young people's practices of digital self-representation and the role of user-generated media in young people's sexual learning. Uh, she's currently um, ARC Future Fellow, leading the project Digital and Data Literacies for Sexual Health Policy and Practice. Um, and among her many pub publications, she is the author of uh, With Alan and Catherine the Porn Report, um, which is the first comprehensive examination of the consumption and production of pornography in Australia. And Kath has also published really widely um, across um, the academic literature, but also in terms of community reports um, to the various stakeholders in this kind of research. So it's wonderful that all of you have joined us tonight. And our topic for tonight is why is sex objectionable? So sexuality is, I guess, regarded as a central aspect in many people's lives, um, a source of pleasure, well-being, um, and satisfaction that contributes to our overall fulfillment and satisfaction. Um, the representation of sex and discussions of sex and sexuality is probably more diverse than ever today. And over the past three decades, um, the internet has arguably diversified the kinds of sex um, that are talked about and indeed that are had. <laughs> um, at the same time, over the last few years, uh, efforts to sanitise social media and strip it of sexual content have really ratcheted up. Um, if we think about um, Australia's Online Safety Act, which was passed uh, just last year, um, it gives the Commissioner the power to, to issue removal notices for any sexual material that is not subject to a restricted access system. Uh, this extends from actual to implied sexual activity, as well as explicit nudity. Meanwhile, most of the major social media corporations have taken steps to purge all so-called adult content from their platforms. Um, and I guess the signal instance of this most recently was uh, Tumblr's move in 2018 or 19 um, to remove uh, any material that depicts human genitals, female presenting nipples um, and sex acts um, from its platform. Now, this uh, deprives users of these sites from accessing and sharing material that's important for self-expression, for learning, for self-fulfillment, for politics, and indeed for people's livelihoods. And this harms uh, sexual and gender minorities, sex workers, artists, and arguably all of us. So what is uh, going on here? Why is sex objectionable? I'm going to ask that question first to Susanna. Well, thank you, Ken. Um, there are many ways to answer the question and I'm not gonna answer all of it. 
Um, but one important reason is that sexual content is not compatible with the commercial mes messages of advertisers who are the actual um, audiences or customers of social media. So if you think of brand management and let's say a brand such as McDonald's, what is the kind of content, user generated content that you want your commercial messages to appear next to? Most of the time that would not be inclusive of sexual content. Um, and basically interests of advertisers um, are crucial um, in defining content policies in commercial social media, which basically encompasses social media. Thanks, Susanna. Um, we'll move now to Pat. Sure, and I have a performance poetry for mine. So um, why is sex objectionable? Because it's so fake, because it's too real, because it's unspeakable, because they're flaunting it, because they're too young, because they're too old, because they're too straight, because they're too queer, because they're too attractive, because they're not attractive enough, because it's addictive, because it's banal, because it's a secret, because it's everywhere because it hurts too much, because it feels too good, because they're too sensitive, because they're desensitized, because I don't understand it, because it's too close to home, because it's so trendy, because it's so 1973, because they're doing it for money, because they're giving it away, because of the mums and dads, because of the children, because of the community, because of the CEO, because of the lobby groups, because the minister wouldn't sign off on the campaign. <laughs> Thank you, Pat. And that really, I think, illustrates what a sort of dense and conflating um, terrain that we're dealing with when we talk about sex generally and also sex uh, in, on, on the internet. Um, over to you, Alan. Why is sex objectionable? Why is sex objectionable? Thank you, Kane. I've pulled out some notes. This was from a chapter that Paul Byron um, and I and Roger Ingham were invited to contribute a few years ago to the Encyclopedia of Gender, Media and Communication on sex as entertainment. And then we wrote it and then they refused to publish it because they said we're being unkind to Andrea Dworkin, which I don't think is fair because we just quoted Andrea Dworkin saying, I'm a feminist and not the fun kind, which is self-representation. The point that I was trying to make uh, with, with Paul in this chapter, and that I think speaks to this is, well, not all sex is objectionable. If you are doing it in the dark with somebody you love and it's unpaid and you're either married we're in a long-term committed relationship and you're doing it to have a baby or you're doing it to build and strengthen your relationship, that's fine. That's not objectionable. The reason that sex is objectionable outside of that, I think clearly is, well, we can illustrate it by saying, in Australia, we've been having a fight for the last couple of years over religious freedom. And when you look at what the religious freedom to do, is wanted to be. It's not the right to, for example, um, protesters who, because of their Christianity, want to support refugees might go into Parliament House. The police are still going to arrest them and drag them away. Religious freedom isn't about having the right to do that. Um, Jesus says very clearly that um, it is easier for a camel to pass through an eye of a needle than for a rich man to get into heaven. But a Christian who followed that to steal from the rich and give to the poor you're not allowed to do that. That's not religious freedom. In fact, from what I can tell, the only religious freedom that is being fought for is the right to discriminate against people on the basis of sexual behavior and sexuality. And so what it means to be uh, a religious person in a, an institutional and a legal and a, 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 the, the sense that's happening in public debate is about sex. And so I'm not a historian of religion, but I know that this is a faculty that has historians of religion. So if there's anyone in the room, please correct me. This is just from Jeffrey Weeks in 1981, his history of sexuality. Um, he points out that there are two general traditions of Christian thought on sexuality. There is the tradition of St. Paul, Pauline, Pauline, which basically says, basically sex is terrible. If you have to have it, then do it because you're married and having babies. But if you can manage to get through your life without ever having it, that is great. The Puritanical tradition, 
then built on that and said, actually, so long as you love somebody and you're doing it to build a relationship, that is fine. So the Pauline and the Puritanical traditions tell us that sex is fine, so long as it's for a higher purpose. But if you're having sex for fun, then that is objectionable. And why is it objectionable? Because the Christians tell you so. Thanks, Alan. Um, so while you were talking, Alan, uh, I was reminded of um, uh, a figure that is uh, used often in sexuality studies to talk about the difference between charmed, um, okay sex, and uh, not okay sex, and that comes from Gail Rubin's work, I think, either in the late 80s or early 90s, um, which talked about um, charmed sex as basically being heterosexual, uh, consensual, uh, procreative, uh, happening behind closed doors and so on, while the beyond the pale sexuality is, is often homosexual, unmarried, casual, non-procreative, non-monogamous, uh, involving objects, commercial, and so on. Now, of course, um, all of these kinds of sexuality um, can be found in the resources of uh, the internet. I was interested um, in teasing out some of what you were saying, Susanna, about um, the way that um, advertising and advertising interests um, tend to align themselves mainly with forms of sexuality that are um, perhaps inside this charm circle uh, rather than the kinds of sexuality that uh, might be considered more objectionable by the custodians of, of you know, the moral public. Yes, absolutely. Um, the term objectionable for the panel comes actually from uh, the community standards of MESA, so Instagram, Facebook, community standards. Um, which label uh, sexual content and sexual communication or soliciting, which basically means any kind of attempt to hook up um, as objectionable. That's kind of a strange. I wonder if this is better. Um, along with self harm um, and um, hate speech, for example. So, so basically, um, nudity. Um, whether it's uh, classical oil paintings, whether it's sort of sexy selfies, um, whether it's uh, imagery connected to information resources on sexual health, uh, becomes framed out in a horizontal manner. Meanwhile, of course, this kind of ubiquitous sexiness, uh, which maybe doesn't fall into the charm circle as, as traditionally construed, um, but it's definitely um, the kind of bread and butter of something like Instagram in how people build influencer careers in, in, in how online fame is created. I mean, think of Kim Kardashian, our example in the objectification book as, as a prime kind of um, example of this. So sex in itself, um, but then again, sex doesn't. And in the objectification book, we start thinking about like when people focus on mediated representations of sex, um, and basically say it's objectifying people, basically most of the time the issue seems to be around sexism. Um, yet the kind of problem becomes mediated depictions of sex. Now, community standards of meta don't have an issue with sexism uh, as such, uh, because the standards uh, need to be horizontal so that machine learning can, can be applied to weed out the stuff that we um, or advertisers or the company can post don't want them that platform. And they also need to be horizontal in the sense that human content moderators would then check stuff that is flagged um, or complained about. Uh, can look at the manual and say, no, it's TDs and it has to go. Um, so it's completely void of context. Um, and I'm not saying that content moderation isn't needed. I'm just interested in how it focuses on kind of negative sexual rights, as in rights not to be harassed, which of course is crucial but they have very little to do with positive sexual rights as in a right to live a satisfactory sexual life as in a right to access sexual information and, and knowledge. Um, so basically what's happening um, is that I could be ousted from Meta if I ask Alan in a casual manner to have sex with me uh, because that's against community standards of uh, consenting adults speaking to such as that to one another, um, which isn't really speaking highly of what kind of sexual rights on that platform then can mean. And when sexuality and sex become framed out of sociability of social media, we are left with a very particular corporate construct, 
um, that's defined with say Puritan echoes exist within that construct, um, but it's basically penned in by lawyers in Silicon Valley. And of course, US legislation fosters SESTA plays a role, but I'm not really aware of that. Could you say a bit more about foster SESTA? It's uh, it's two laws uh, that passed uh, the US Senate in 2018 in the spring, and they were influential in terms of what happened. There were many reasons why Tumblr failed, but foster SESTA was like a, it was definitely influential. It's uh, it's they are basically uh, framed as anti-trafficking laws, but in practice, um, they, for the first time, uh, made online platforms responsible for the content posted by users. So frame them as publishers, rather than a passive kind of platform where people just you know, do stuff. Uh, which means that if there's content that is in conflict with the law, um, the companies are liable. So in order to circumvent and kind of preempt it, to take preemptive measures, um, Meta, for example, tightened their community standards uh, drastically. Um, so, so as to basically uh, to ask more, uh, too much than, than too little, because the risks involved in, in ousting sex are really minor. Because I mean, that's what the advertisers want and that what the US basically officials are also happy with. Um, it's kind of seldom, it, it's kind of rare to find people who are saying like, <laughs> we want the TVs on the platform. Um, because they become kind of identified as peddlers as smarts um, you know, on the wrong, wrong side of history. Whereas I'm very strongly advocating for this on the platform based on consent in the sense of opting in. Uh, like my, my solution, which is perfect, but it's more like a Twitter solution, where you opt in into seeing certain kinds of content and posting certain kinds of content. Hence, you can also opt out. One of the things that was raised in response to Tumblr beginning to ban its um, uh, sexual content was, um, you know, I, I think Tumblr itself sort of said, well, there are other parts of the internet that sex can go to. And I wondered if anybody uh, wanted to speak a little bit to what is at stake um, in having most of our social media platforms um, enacting a, a very PG or even G <laughs> version of um, sexual sociability. Um, but then, of course, uh, other sorts of content um, monopolised by um, particular uh, pornography sites um, doing most of the work of sexual representation, um, if I can put it that way. One of the things that, that I've been looking at, uh, um, I'm an associate investigator in the ARC Centre of Excellence for Automated Decision Making and Society, which uh, is looking at content moderation at various times. And, and one of the things that I'm interested in and why I'm kind of interested in organisational digital and data literacy now as opposed to uh, digital and data literacy as an individual attribute is uh, one of the things that I was thinking about as I started um, the project is how much time and energy and money and resources and goodwill goes into creating sexual and reproductive health content around the world, um, particularly in places where there's not comprehensive sex education in schools, or there's very strong um, stigma around talking about sexuality and gender in particular ways in family settings or in certain kinds of social settings. International development agencies and the UN and a range of other organizations spend hundreds and millions of dollars developing online content and you all will have seen that you know with engaging with young people through building this jolly campaign that you know they can access in their own time what happens is they can't because um and i have a phd student with me right now joanna williams who's part of the center um who, who had this experience in her own professional experience they can't advertise their own work they can't promote it to young people um, they can't get engagement in the feed, if you like, because of um, what's known as shadow banning, where particular keywords are excluded from searches um, or are um, downplayed in terms of how the algorithm might boost it or recommend it to people. 
And so huge amounts of money that have been spent on building engaging evidence-based um, campaigns, content and so on, basically wafts away into the ether. And many of the health organizations have no idea why or how this is happening. Um, their appeals to social media platforms get met with an automated response. Um, it, sometimes they fall foul because they've been, um, they've, they've put up the bad content too many times and automatically they're excluded from advertising their material again or trying to circulate the material again. And it's actually a, a really significant issue in places where, um, you know, I was talking to educators at a conference in, in early 2020 where a lot of money has been spent on kind of period education for um, young women who left school, school early or kind, kinds of things that I think the people developing community standards would say, oh, no, 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 that's no, that's not at all the content that we would be trying to suppress. And yet, because as, as Susanna says, the, the aim is to um, moderate and scale because the content might be objectionable, um, what happens is, um, uh, you know, th there's tremendous waste in this space and, and, and you know, lost resources and lost opportunities and lost opportunities for um, learning for, you know, younger people, but also older people who have not accessed that information about gender, for example, or about sexual health in other places. Um, do you have a response to that? I, well, I, I would like to pick up on something that Susanna said before, because I think that it answers your question. Susanna, can you tell us more about the benefits of having titties on social media? <laughs> <laughs> well, if we think about social media and sexuality as part of social mobility, it's an it's an issue of importance on, on scales, both personal and, and collective and, and social. And the understanding that titties in social media is also questioned in a straight framework of male titillation and female multiplication, it basically flattens out, flattens out the ways that social lives are lived. And the fact that these titties, unless they are in the framework of, let's say, there's exception for breast cancer, cancer, so showing, sorry. Um, so it's okay to show breasts if it's in front of, of breast cancer, uh, breastfeeding, or protest, I think female as a protest, otherwise they are objectionable and obscene. Um, whereas if we think about, especially not, I mean, pandemic has really made things come into focus in terms of social distancing and people managing their sexual lives at a distance. Um, so sexual communication, uh, be it with sort of virtual strangers or with partners, it really doesn't matter in those horizontal states. Uh, whether whether it's um, exchange of pictures uh, based on consent or not um, is not or kind of mutual uh, agreement is not an issue so I could get ousted for sending uh, pictures of my titties to my partner for example um, without anyone objective I mean without anyone really uh, objecting to the thing except for the platform that is now the publisher of my titties uh, in this framework even if it would be in a messenger um, because the kind of perceived privacy of messaging, it's just, it's not about privacy, it's about invisibility, it's about lack of public exposure, but the same community standards apply to sort of um, private exchanges. So I'd say the value of TDs and social media, it's basically the value of, of sexuality and sociability, it's sexual expression and, and sexual pleasure. Yes, and of course, I mean, thinking about sexual lives today and sexual interactions. Um, in fact, uh, media are very much part of how people have sex today. And that's come home um, very clearly for us over the context of the various lockdowns and so on in the context of the, the COVID epidemic. Um, Kath, in some of your work, you've talked about how um, a lot of the debate uh, around um, sexualized imagery um, on the media uh, focuses on what porn does to young people. Um, and uh, you've argued that it's much more important to focus on what young people do with sexually explicit images and so on. So I wondered if you could um, talk a little bit about why it's important to switch the focus to 
people's cultures of producing, distributing, um, sharing, sexually um, suggested material. Yeah. So, um, and and this this um, kind of conversation took me through a range of projects of thinking about dating app cultures and the way people might connect on apps. Some of the work we did, like with the way people might connect through apps, or the way they might negotiate. Um, build, you know, build affinity, but also, like, in a literal sense, kind of negotiate a sexual encounter through image exchange. Um, there are, you know, there's a lot of empirical research, and, and actually at a certain point I decided, like, I'm never going to interview a young person again about why they use porn because there's so many decades of research where people keep saying the same thing like why do we keep harassing them and that's why I began to think about what do organizations know about media and kind of switch to this notion of organizational literacy because um, it seemed to me that the, the, the people who didn't really understand vernacular culture very well were the organizations who kept demanding more evidence um, the empirical evidence from the young people without actually ever listening or acting on what had already been presented to them so, I mean, we know that um, young people, and right now I'm still working with young people, but I'm working with 18 to 29 year olds who are still young people within Australian policy, um, but tend to be very much ignored in when the conversations about young people assume that, that we're only talking about school age young people. Um, uh, that, yeah, pe people, for example, and other people here have done this work, um, look at porn to see different kinds of bodies. They look at porn to see how a person like me might have sex when a person like them was never mentioned or might as well have not been in the classroom when they were at school. Um, they look at porn as a form of accumulating social capital. So it is entirely cultural in a sense um, and not at all kind of um, uh, individualistic or kind of psychological, <laughs> but, but much more um, of a kind of transaction in a marketplace. Um, so yeah, there are all kinds of things that people do with porn. And, and when I've done work with adults thinking about sexting, for example, the notion that people might share nudes um, not to be sexy or to arouse, but to be funny. Um, so we've talked in that work about like the sneaky hat selfie where you hold the hat in front of your genitals or whatever as a joke. Um, and who gets to have a funny body and whose body just has to be a good body or a bad body. Um, and, and all of these things, I think, really complicate the idea that um, that sex or the understanding of sex is, it should only be understood in relation to a kind of individual subjectivity or a dyadic intimate relationship, as, as Alan was saying. That's a rambly answer, but <laughs> that's my answer. <laughs> I want to go back, actually, to the point that you were making, Susanna, about horizontal um, forms of regulation of the internet. And if you could talk a little bit about um, other potential ways of um, assessing content and the importance of that, because I guess one of the things I took from what you said there was that, um, you know, the meaning of a sexually explicit image or material is, is going to be highly sort of context specific. And yet, the tools that a lot of platforms use to, to, to monitor this kind of stuff really aren't contextually specific. So I wondered if you could talk, or anybody could talk a little. It's, it is a tricky question when you think about, I mean, the question of scale, um, but just the question of massive scale of how much stuff there is. I mean, although uh, human content moderators and this is usually a labor that is offshored um, into countries with cheap labor costs. Um, so the Philippines, um, India, um, other places, and it's not, and there's a fair amount of research about the fall of that work. It is not pretty, um, whether it's YouTube content moderation or this video is particularly tricky um, to actually moderate through algorithmic means. Uh, whereas on Facebook, it's a combination of video and, and then uh, still image. So I mean, 
um, algorithmic governance here, it's, I think it's a default and it's necessary uh, in order just for things to work. But what doesn't really work uh, is that if there are complaints made of, let's say, let's say uh, there was no complaint made, but a mutual friend of ours, Ben Light, my co-author, took a picture of a public statue on a beach in the in south of England, uh, which was a picture of a naked man with a penis. Uh, not a red one, just a penis, and as statues might have. And it was on a beach with, you know, kiddies running around. Um, and there was a, a picture of that, like a, a part of a kind of montage of what the seashore was looking like, and he got, well, that was got um, basically uh, flagged by an algorithm, and he complained about the decision, and then he was stopped from communicating on Facebook for about a week because it was not his first violation um, of the code. So even if um, users sort of complain that this might actually not be against community standards, uh, um, these complaints generally don't have any uh, other effect except getting the user frozen in time or, or kind of ousted for a certain amount of time from the platform. So that human connection um, doesn't work. And the reason it doesn't work is because it's horizontal. Um, when Bert Reynolds died, uh, everyone was sharing a picture of his new centerfold, um, and many of us <laughs> got that locked out of the system um, until the decision was reversed. But the decision to um, out to cut off basically uh, stop for people com communi communicating wasn't uh, reversed. But it, I mean, it speaks of real difficulties uh, in platform platform governance, and I'm not trying to downplay them. But basically, if there is this um, attempt to, um, to balance uh, machine learning or how machines basically calculate images they don't see, they can't, um, with human uh, kind of supervision, then that really should be uh, reconsidered um, and the principles of that. Because the standards are actually this, there have been these kind of leaked uh, memos from Facebook in particular, uh, basically detailing how, what the detail of gore and violence that is acceptable. So crushed heads are fine, but titties are not. And of course, this is something, something that's quite familiar from, let's say, Hollywood cinema. Like, to what extent displays of violence um, are fine, uh, whereas any kind of depiction of nudity or, or sexuality really is not. So it's also very kind of culturally specific understanding. Uh, that then again don't scale internationally. And here I'm, I'm waving the Finnish Selena card. I mean, coming from a country that has a kind of a social nudity culture that is not sexual by definition, um, although it of course can be. Um, this kind of horizontal labeling of all nudity uh, with objectionability, it just, it's bizarre. Yeah, I wondered if anybody wanted to comment on that actually, and you, Alan, but actually any of you. <laughs> Um, about the, um, well, the distinction between sexually explicit material and porn. Um, um, yes. Um, and thank you so much again, Susanna, for inviting me onto this panel, because this is fascinating. This is kind of, you've, you've got me thinking about a lot of things. Um, so Catherine Mumby and I are currently putting together a, a grant application on um, digital pornography and sexual health. And one of the things that we've been thinking about is porn literacy and what that means. So um, I did some work with Paul Byron on the way that porn literacy has become a buzzword and it's um, a lot of porn literacy programs now for young people teaching them about pornography, but it tends to be very limited. It tends to mean either teaching young people not to look at porn, so it's just abstinence, porn is bad for you, or it's teaching young people to uh, repeat, porn is not real, giving them this um, uh, mantra that they have to repeat while they're watching it to remind themselves. And what is missing from it is porn literacy, developed from media literacy, which developed from literacy programs, and that was always about learning to read and write. And so porn literacy in terms of teaching people how to sexually self-represent has fallen from the table completely. That kind of is brought under the, the work on sexting, but even there, it's hard to get past the abstinence only approach. And that was making me think as well, kind of about what you were talking about, Susanna, what is the value of having a public sphere where you can be sexy? Is that you learn how to, many of us, not everybody, but many of us are sexual beings. We have identities, we have passions, we have desires, 
And it is good for us to be able to communicate those to other human beings and to learn from a culture and from the language that circulates in a culture, and that can be words and it can be visuals, how to represent that to other human beings. Here I am, this is who I am, this is what I want, this is what excites me, this is what I'm looking for. And that part of the, the language that is cut out when that's taken out of the social media is something that is really, really sad. But then I was thinking, well, is it the end of the world? Of course, it's not the end of the world. So social media are private companies, they can do whatever the hell they want. They're not a public good. If we think it would be a public good to have a social media that allowed titties, then we should have a state-run titty-based <laughs> social media that is not subject to the vicissitudes of Elon Musk buying Twitter and deciding that he doesn't want pornography on it anymore. Will he do that? I wouldn't be surprised because he's that kind of freedom of speech advocate for whom freedom of speech means shutting down people you disagree with. So um, I wouldn't be at all surprised if we lose that from Twitter. If that happens, if Twitter goes, um, we find ourselves back in the 1970s. It's not the end of the world. People will still find porn magazines under benches and parks like they used to. Um, and that will be sad because what we have seen over the past, I would say that the golden age of social media and porn was the mid 2010s, to the end of the 2010s, when we had enough social media to, for people to find it easily and Tumblr had not yet been shut down. And what happened during that period, we saw groups discover each other and represent themselves and the emergence of all kinds of diverse trans communities and non-binary communities and asexual communities that had not had that public space and that ability to communicate before. If that all goes, then it's not gonna vanish. We have had that experience. We will remember that experience. We will find ways to talk to each other. We'll lose something and that will be sad, but we'll always remember the golden age of titties on social media. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Alan. So thank you all so much for this wide ranging discussion. I guess I, it's about time to open this up for audience questions, including our in-person audience, which is pretty big. And also apparently we have a very big online uh, audience as well. So Catherine. Catherine yeah, um, that was fantastic. Thank you. Um, one of the things I've been thinking about a lot is, and this is a purely about sexuality, Diversity. Um, you know, I mean, I think when we're looking at online and social media, you know, it's really tempting, I get pulled into this myself, you know, to think in a utopian way, right? The truth is far more mixed than this. And so I, I think, you know, I'm sort of being anecdotal here. Um, but one of my friends, John Wiley, and all of Sam's friends, um, fall into that. Um, you know, that's just the, sorry. Okay, sorry. So, that, so that's the category that, uh, you know, and so I, I'm in touch with a large group of young people who identify as non-binary, trans, queer, pansexual. And, you know, on one hand, I, so I see, and I, maybe, a, you know, a skewed thing, um, incredible advances in the way in which young people are articulating their sexuality and their gender identity. Um, and a lot of that has clearly come through their social and online interactions as much as through their face-to-face -face interactions. Then at the same time, we're witnessing this incredibly, I think, conservative turn when we're looking at a lot of political debate. Look at the stuff with Catherine Deves in the federal election, who's, you know, I think her, many of her comments could be labelled as Transphobic, she would disagree with that, and she has the right to represent herself. But, and along with this movement that we've seen that really comes out of radical feminism, I think, where you've got the TERFs, you know, the trans exclusionary radical feminists and, 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 and the sort of whole anti sex worker, and it's often couched as was alluded to in sex trafficking. So I find it very hard, I know it's a broad question, to kind of know where are we at. I mean, do you, from the work that you're all doing, do you see that, that there's a sort of wave of progressiveness coming out of younger people that is triggering this reactivity? It's not an answerable question, but you know, I'm interested in what you think. I know marriage equality. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, because I think it, it, that in Australia anyway, um, the young 
trans people became a kind of wedge community in that campaign and, and they, there was good traction to be gained from it and it's um, snowballed since then. And, and so, yeah, in Australia, I, I kind of don't see it as a, a social media fallout issue. The, some of the contemporary debate I see as a fallout from um, the political mileage that some people got out of gender diversity as a kind of um, anti-marriage equality strategy. Other people might think of different things. I'm not, not gonna answer your question, but definitely if we think of, of Tumblr again, for Byron would have probably many things to say about the loss of Tumblr um, for queer, queer, young queer communities um, and has written beautifully about it. Um, Alexander Cho did a wonderful article for New Media and Society before the policy changed, arguing that Tumblr um, was the chosen platform for gender and sexual non conforming young people of color because it didn't have a remain policy. Like, you know, Meta wants to you use your, they need your actual name, it's against the terms of use to give a false name because they want to aggregate your online identity in order to extract more um, user data. That is, that can be aggregated into you seeing the user. Uh, Google ID wants to do exactly the same. Uh, where Tumblr never had this policy, you could have multiple accounts, you still can, use not the titties, um, without tying them into one recognizable identity. So basically, Alex's argument was, and I think it really does stand, that these policies that are in place to make the internet safer by removing sexual content, again, this negative approach to sexual rights actually works against the safety and well-being of, of in, part, in particular marginalized um, young people uh, by forcing them to use their actual identity and hence uh, the risk of bullying, of outing, all kinds of exposure. Um, and I've been really obsessed with this notion of safety um, and the way it becomes sort of thrown around and, and what everything that goes, goes into it. Um, and oftentimes, of course, it's exactly the opposite. You know what the outcome of this safety procedure is. It can be uh, hugely violent. Some other questions from the audience. So one of the questions coming in through the webinar is um, open, I guess, to the whole panel, and it would say, what would you imagine a future could look like that is affirming of sex and sexuality? What would we need to do to get there? In terms of online platforms, just, just better community standards um, that are actually respectful of sexual rights and that are ambitious in trying to find better solutions than this horizontal filtering out. Um, I'm part of a project with Yonis and Ben uh, and Kat Tidenberg looking at sexual uh, social media platforms in, in Sweden, Estonia and Finland. And basically we've been in, interviewing more than 50 people uh, on the perceived value of, of sexual being on online platforms and also the risks and, and their manage, management. But basically what emerges is, is this kind of comparison with these sexual platforms where sexual relating is kind of the mode. Uh, um, with something like Instagram, so that they become like, it's like Instagram, but better. Although these are actually web-based, they are not apps because they can't be in app stores because of app store policy. That again, doesn't allow for nudity and sexuality because Apple and, and Google. So if we actually speak to people um, about what they want to do and how they want to do it, then we get this range of things. Uh, for some, it might be that the non-sexual social media is precisely the thing that they want to go for, um, but that's not going to be the whole truth. So ambition um, and kind of um, respect for sexual rights. Um, but of course, I mean, at the same time, when let's say freedom of speech is something that social media discourse is very much preoccupied with, sexual rights aren't recognized as, as human rights. 
uh, where they should be. Of course, they won't be because the United States won't ratify them as, as, as human rights. Um, but if we start from that understanding, um, then I think there is an argument to be made on a very kind of abstract liberal level, at least. Yeah. And this is something that Pat has been thinking about a while back. Yeah. And, and I think there's, there's also, I mean, just sparking off the conversation about safety, there's often a, a belief when it comes to making dating apps safer or making social media platforms safer, that yes, what we need is more surveillance, more capacity for police to access your messages, um, more uh, the, the, what um, Zara Stardust and Rosalie Gillett, some colleagues of mine that I've been thinking about this with, um, would term a carceral response to sexuality and, and to online safety that kind of mimics the really punitive um, embodied aspects of, of, you know, carceral safety, um, which we know kind of disproportionately then criminalise particular kinds of bodies. And so, you know, the, our colleague Bronwyn Carlson at Macquarie is like, you know, no Aboriginal person will ever use a dating app again if the cops automatically get their messages like what who on earth would be safer um, as an indigenous person by knowing their online chat automatically went to the police um, so I, I think in terms of thinking of a, a, a positive future I think and this is you know a, a I guess a, a design justice or a transformative justice kind of mode of thinking like what would a just or safe space look like if it was actually developed by the communities who are most impacted by safety there and there you know there are social media spaces that are being developed in those ways as, as kind of very niche and alternative spaces but tech runs on scale and that's kind of the problem if, if it's if it's good tech it's scalable tech um, and as soon as the tech is scaled the capacity for um, a, a kind of transformative approach as opposed to a transactional approach begins to diminish. Um, so that's my, I mean, a dystopian, utopian balance. I, I, I would like to see us grapple with some of the current inequities and build the new out of that, but there's no money in that. We haven't really talked about the role credit card companies play in the policing of sexuality currently, but we, you know, Visa and MasterCard currently have a very strong say in relation to your sexuality and how you can express it, even though you um, may not know about it. So that's a whole other area we, we, we haven't got into. But um, yeah, I, I think it's, it's very difficult in this space to think about, you know, right now there's no outside of capitalism. There's also kind of no outside of platform culture in relation to sexuality or platform economy. Some other questions from the floor. <laughs> I was just going to say, maybe you could lend some more information on how Visa and MasterCard do police uh, sexualities and bodies. Yeah, and I, I've got to say, I am not, I haven't been reading this stuff recently. So this is a conversation where I'm not going to appropriately cite the people I should be citing, although Susanna may be able to drop the correct names in. But um, in more and more payment platforms um, are, I guess, I guess the payment venues like PayPal, for example, are platforms in themselves and they're part of the social media ecology um, and they determine the kinds of things that can be done with the platform or through the platform. So one of the critiques I would say when I'm listening to sex workers in this space or you know who, who have um, scholarship in this space and, and increasingly they do, the Hacking Hustling Group in, in the US and others are saying, Yes, you know, the, the wave of the hand about Tumblr was, yes, you can go off to the commercial spaces. You don't need to stay in this more egalitarian community space to 
um, be sexual, but actually that's not the case because if you if if um, Amazon thinks you're a sex worker, they'll shut down your wish list. Um, if PayPal thinks you're a sex worker, they'll freeze your account. Um, so organisations um, that may be based in a particular country with particular laws, for example, the US, where certain kinds of sex work are criminalised, have a say over the conduct of sex workers in New South Wales, where sex work is legal and decriminalised. Um, so that, that, that's the sense in which I would say a site like Visa, and Visa and MasterCard, um, the, there were issues with OnlyFans recently around payment practices on OnlyFans. So in a sense, the notion that, yes, yeah, sex sells, it, 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 people are in some cases very strongly policed around selling sex in the place where the broader community are. So it becomes harder and harder to safely do sex work when payment platforms um, implement their own forms of kind of moral policing of sexuality. There's also kind of lobbying that goes into that. Thinking of uh, Pornhub in December 2019, um, there was this lobbying uh, Christoph, New York Times um, columnist, in collaboration with a group called Exodus Cry, which is an anti-trafficking organization of Christian faith, um, basically studied, Christoph published this article called The Children of Pornhub, arguing that Pornhub makes money off child exploitation and rape. Um, and he's all, he was also lobbying for Fosta Sesta and, and previous laws, anti-trafficking laws, so he's been at this for a while. Um, and as part of that move, he basically uh, appealed to, well, Visa and MasterCard and PayPal, like you keep on profiting from this, and also to Google that you know, search functions find porn and hence everyone profits. And this public shaming um, had the effect that Visa and MasterCard dropped Pornhub so that content creators actually couldn't get paid, uh, which wasn't particularly then useful for the sex workers on that platform. But since they were traffic, traffic that really was not because trafficking basically um, in this framework, like sex or sex workers seen as trafficking, there is no distinction um, made. Um, and there's much I could say about the Pornhub thing, uh, but I won't. What I will say is that in terms of internet history in the 90s, um, before gaming picked up, before uh, Amazon ever made profit, which was like 2000, I think it broke even, um, porn really was a thing that did sell. Like people were willing to pay for porn back in the day uh, because it was standard, like you would buy a DVD or you would buy something, um, hence people would also uh, spend money online. So actually online payment systems like streaming video um, technologies were first developed for the needs of the so-called adult uh, industry. Uh, processing fees have always been higher for commercial sex because it's seen as a high risk enterprise. So as intermediaries, these platforms, payment platforms have really made a huge amount of money. Uh, of commercial sex. Um, but at the same time, um, it's very kind of, um, I would say, um, there's not much commitment <laughs> on the part of those platforms to uh, keep livelihoods going. Um, when it becomes like a reputational uh, liability, or, or in that sense, bad for the brand, uh, these people just have to go. But in a historical perspective, it's actually quite interesting um, how important commercial sex was like once you know people were fine realizing that you can pay with your visa and, and nothing happens then you might also buy a book online uh, Wendy Chan has written about this um, in a way pioneering role of commercial sex for payment systems um, it's really interesting listening to you talk about online payment systems and uh, processing fees um, in the sense, well, in the sense that um, the discussion of sort of sexually explicit material and, and pornography um, is really such a different sort of discussion than it was in the 1990s and 1980s when the original sort of holy or unholy alliance between um, um, anti-pornography feminists and, 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 and sort of conservatives uh, took shape. I wondered if any of you would like to reflect on that in closing, just how the um, discussion around pornography and indeed around people's sexualities 
um, has changed in the context of uh, digital media in terms of the debates we have, um, the sorts of things that we're focusing on um, in the field, uh, and so on. Just as including remarks, because I think we're. Sorry. I'll tell you a story. So one of the things that's happened with pornography now is that it, uh, the uh, barriers to entry are massively lowered for production and distribution. Anybody can make pornography. We could do it right now and upload it onto the internet. Um, and that has resulted in a huge spread in the kinds of pornography that are made. And so the kinds of debates that used to be, the way that the research was framed in the terms of classic social science, which was, what are the effects of pornography? You now have to ask, well, what kinds of pornography are you talking about? Are you talking about pink and white or crash bad or the ethical uh, queer femme productions or the um, um, girls gone wild? Or what, what kind of porn is it? And so inspired by that, I um, uh, just ran a research project with uh, Melissa Kang from the health faculty here in the University of Sydney. And it was called, um, how do you identify the healthiest pornography for young people? So it was a Delphi, an expert panel of adolescent health experts, sex educators, sexual health experts from around the world saying, how would you identify healthy pornography? Pornography that helps young people defined as 18 to 25 year olds um, to um, flourish as healthy sexual beings. And it was fascinating. And despite the differences in backgrounds, there's a whole range of things people agreed on, a diversity of body types, a diversity of genders, focus on pleasure for everybody involved, a whole range of things, fascinating. So that's currently being refereed by the Journal of Sex Research. So I published a blog about it and I tweeted it. Um, how can you identify healthy porn for young people? Here's the, here's the criteria, go and have a look. And then Libs of TikTok picked it up and it went viral in the American alt-right ecosphere. And I got over 2,000 responses, many of which were death threats and accusations of pedophilia because there is now, because sexy is good, but sexualized is bad. And so the line has to be drawn so clearly, particularly the alt-right in America now are um, obsessed with anybody who talks about sex is grooming or a pedophile going after young people. And then they started tweeting my husband, and then they started Facebook messaging my friends, telling them all about the pedophile. So I ended up shutting down my, my Twitter profile. So that's my, that's my story of where we are today and how things have changed. <laughs> Thank you, Alan. Did anybody else want to make a comment, or are we going yes, to thanks. end on <laughs> Alan's quite distressing story? It's kind of difficult to follow that. I would just say that as someone who's been studying porn for something like 20 years, uh, I've been increasingly wondering if that's actually a historical notion uh, that we sort of tie, when we talk about porn, we tie it into certain cultures of production, consumption, uh, and circulation um, in ways that might not be helpful in acknowledging the diversity of sexual media today in terms of, you know, what people do with their phones, uh, what they do on multiple platforms. Um, where's this notion of objectionability it, it's like this blanket that everything in a way becomes porn um, and a social problem um, so as a, as a porn researcher I've just been I have no answer to this but it's a maybe so yes maybe we just need a different vocabulary actually for talking about media with cultures of sex great well thank you very much please join me in thanking our panelists uh, for the <laughs> And thanks also to um, Sydney Social Sciences and Humanities Advanced Research. Center. Okay, and I'd just like to thank Kane and Kath and Alan for giving um, Susanna what I hope was a wonderful send off. That was a very tight panel. And Susanna, anytime you want to come back, please do.